Well, it's been a great service already, and uh, I'm so glad that you're here, and you lost an hour's sleep, but you're still in the house of the Lord, ready to worship, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here today. It was back in the middle of September when I told you that sometime in the next uh, six to nine months that I was going to be turning the leadership of Southeast over to uh, the capable hands of Kyle Eidelman, and that then I would stay for a couple more months after that and embark on whatever God has next for me. And today, uh, we're going to take uh, that next step. And at the end of this message, uh, Kyle's going to join me up here as your new senior pastor, and at that time, we'll get a chance to officially welcome him in that capacity and also to get to pray for him. One of the things that I appreciate about Southeast is that there's always been this incredible spirit of unity. And one of the reasons that we are a large church is because we, we have never split. Uh, we've never had discord or division. And I have been thrilled to hear so many people in the last few months that have just gone out of their way to tell me how excited that they are about Kyle's leadership, and I am equally excited. You know, it's never healthy for an organization, it's never healthy for a church to question where it is that they are looking for direction or where they're looking for, for leadership. And we have been in an incredible season of growth for a little over the past year, and we don't want to lose any momentum in the exchange. And uh, it's important, I think, for all of you to know that r regardless of who the senior pastor of a church is, uh, that Jesus Christ wants Christians to be known by the way we love one another. And that's to be the hallmark characteristic that, that makes us stand out from everyone else. And this weekend, we are starting a brand new series. It's called People Matter. And we want to recalibrate to make sure that the, the name people associate with Southeast uh, isn't my name, it's not Kyle's name, it's not your name. It's the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, if, that's, if that's our focus and if that's our foundation, then uh, this church will do really well for a long time as long as we lift high the cross of Christ and lift him up. Um, there were two great plagues which swept through the Roman Empire. Uh, the first one occurred in the year A.D. 165, uh, the second one took place in A.D. 251. And both of those times, in each instance, those plagues wiped out one-third of the Roman Empire, if you can imagine that many people dying in those plagues. Now, the non-Christians back then tried to avoid contact with the people who, who had experience the plague. In fact, there are many stories about pagans taking sick people out and, and dumping their bodies in the gutter before they had passed away. And it may be a matter of days, it may be a matter of hours, but they just didn't want to be close to them and they didn't want to run the risk of getting sick. At the same time, there were Christians, on the other hand, who nursed the sick some of them even were able to uh, survive. They, they weren't close to death, and the Christians nursed them back to health. And there were some who succumbed to the same plague that those that they were ministering to had already had. And so there were Christians who were quite visible in both of those plagues, and as a result of it, there were many people who came to Christ, not just in death, but also in life afterwards. Historian Will Durant wrote this, about both of those times. Never had the world seen such a dispensation of alms as was now organized by the church. The church helped widows, orphans, the sick, prisoners, and victims of, of catastrophes. She frequently intervened to protect the lower orders from unusual exploitation. And since actions speak louder than words, here's what, here's what the church was trying to communicate. Here's what followers of Christ were communicating. They were trying to communicate that since people matter to God, they should matter to us as well. And there was a time in the early history of the church when that was the norm for the church. And I truly believe that it can happen again, and I, I believe it can happen with you and with me. And we usually think that if, if there is some huge need and there's a, a natural catastrophe or there's some crisis, well, then I'll be glad to jump in and I'll be glad to help. But what if the catastrophe has disguised itself with a forced smile? What if the situation is the person across the table from you that is fighting back tears or whose heart has sunk so low that it's difficult to even see the crisis that they're in? 
But you don't have to wait for a plague for your eyes to see the way Jesus sees and to see people and to see that they matter. And many of you have sent in stories by social media and by texting to us of, of people who gave you value and honor and who affirmed you in a time that maybe was difficult in your life. And you shared those stories with us. And I noticed as I read through every one of them that there was a pattern that emerged in all of them. And here was a pattern. It wasn't always something big that, that, that someone did for you. It could have been something small, but they did it at an opportune time, whether they knew it or not, that made a huge difference in your life. And as a result of that, things changed for you. It may have been something small. It may have been offering a listening ear to a coworker who is going through a personal challenge. It, it might be helping out a neighbor who's in need or maybe helping someone in your Bible study to, to move. Or it might be befriending someone from another culture who may be new to this area or new to our country. In John chapter 13, Verses 34 and 35, Jesus says this. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. He goes on to say, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And for the next six weeks, I, I want this to be our anthem. I want us to be so caught up and wrapped up in, in loving others that we begin to see people the way that God sees them. My hope and prayer is that in this series, you will be encouraged to be intentional and that you will be available to those in need. So let's divide this topic up into several different segments. The first segment is the goal. Uh, what's the goal of, of this series? Well, what if every person felt valued by you? Everyone from the drive through worker to the school principal, person who works in the maintenance department uh, to the company CEO or the the person who works at the DMV to the unborn child. If everyone can feel important, like they matter to us, think of it like this. I want you to imagine a church where everyone lived and loved as if everyone mattered. What could God do with us? How could God use Southeast if we were known in the community as a church that, that tried to outlove one another? And when you begin to realize a person's worth to God and their value to him, all of a sudden it changes the way you, you look at people. Now in our fast paced and in our, our selfie culture that we have, we struggle to take our eyes off of ourselves, let alone to place our eyes on others. And there's no more uh, powerful example of intentionally expressing value and love to people than that of the life of Jesus Christ. His words and his actions communicated that people matter. And Jesus was the master of caring about the small things in people's lives. He wanted people to experience transformation through an encounter with him. And Jesus was always doing this on, on a daily basis. And that leads us to the second area, and that is the example. When you're looking for an example, you can, you can always look to Jesus. He's the standard. He's, he's the one that sets the example for us. If you want to live the way that you've been called to live, then look at the life of Jesus. And the Bible gives us a, a written record which shows us how it is that he responded in different settings with different people. So I want you to take your Bible out or your, your mobile app. If you have a Bible, there's one right in front of you. Uh, you can go to the book of John in the New Testament. You go about two-thirds of the way back in your Bible and you'll find the Gospel of John. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna kinda walk through. I, I, I was amazed a couple weeks ago when I was just looking at the Gospel of John and just seeing how chapter after chapter we see how Jesus gave value to people. And we're not gonna look at every single chapter but we are going to look at some familiar stories and just briefly take a look at some snapshots of how it is that Jesus expressed love and how he showed that people truly matter. How does Jesus show that people matter first? He intervenes to help out a family. Look in John chapter two. In John chapter two, Jesus attends a wedding and it's on a Tuesday. You say, well, who gets married on a Tuesday? Well, a lot of Jewish people do. You know why? In the, in the Genesis account of creation, on the third day of the week, on a Tuesday, that's the only day in the creation account where God says, and it was good and he says it twice. 
And so the Jewish people believe that that's a double blessing and that's a good day to get, to get married on. And so on this third day of the week, there's going to be this wedding ceremony. Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't shared with you yet, but uh, last December, uh, my son, Sam, uh, proposed to Kathleen Rotz and, uh, and she said yes. So they are getting married. Uh, yeah, you can clap for that. I'm excited about it. Uh, Kathleen is from Georgia, and they met at Liberty University, and so both families have been praying, and they have been preparing, and they have been planning uh, for the big day, and we're very excited. When Kathleen had been dating Sam for a while, she told her dad that Sam's dad preached at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, and he said, Southeast Christian Church? He said, that's where Kyle Eidelman preaches. I'm glad you think it's funny. Uh, he had not heard of me, and that's, that's fine, but he said, I, I have every one of Kyle's books. He said, I, whenever I go out for a run, I listen to audio books, and I, I listen to him all the time. He was just so, so excited. Last week, I had a church member who will remain nameless say to me, Dave, when are you gonna start writing books like Kyle? I said, well, I've already written eight books. <laughs> she said, I've never heard of any of them. <laughs> so I, I was a little down in the dumps after that. I was taken back. I gotta be honest with you. I went to Kyle for some advice and some encouragement. He had some great words for me. This is what he said. He said, hang in there, Dave. Don't give up. <laughs> so I, I can't win any way you slice it, right? He didn't really say that, he, he, he didn't really say hang in there. Um, <laughs> but back in John 2, uh, Jesus attends this, this wedding, and most commentators think that it's a close family friend or a relative, and that's why Mary is begging for his involvement, and that's why she's directly involved in this. He's never done a public miracle, but, but his mom gives him that look that only a mom can give. It's like you're needed now. You are the only one who can intervene and save this day. And so Jesus asked them to fill some huge jars with water. And then somehow through Christ's power, the water is turned into wine. And we pick the story up in chapter two in verse nine and 10. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew and then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you have saved the best till now. That's Jesus intervening and giving honor to a family. In John chapter three and in John chapter four, we see that people matter as Jesus takes time to listen and to talk. I put listen in italics for a reason. Because sometimes we think that we've had a conversation with someone, but we really haven't because we did all the talking and we didn't bother to listen. But Jesus did. In John chapter three, he has a, a deep, long, meaningful, spiritual conversation uh, with Nicodemus. And it's not at a convenient time. It's not at lunchtime. They didn't have it set up or I'll catch at the coffee shop for, uh, at the morning time. No, this is late at night because Nicodemus didn't want anybody to see him. You know, and so something happens there. Jesus listens to him and talks with him. The same thing happens in John chapter four. He has a conversation with a Samaritan woman. You say he had a conversation with a Samaritan woman? Yes. You see, back then a Jewish man wasn't supposed to talk in public with another woman unless it was a sister or, or a relative. And Jesus went beyond that, though. This was a Samaritan woman. This should have been a natural enemy. There was racial and ethnic tension there. And Jesus talks with her. Even when the disciples come up and they, they stay at a distance, they kind of object to what is taking place. And Jesus is, in fact, fueled by their objection. And when they step back, Jesus steps forward. Jesus didn't have an ounce of prejudice within him. He sees people for what's on the inside rather than what's on the outside. What if we did the same thing? 
What if we tore down the bridges rather than putting them up? In John chapter 8, uh, turn over a few chapters, we, we see that people matter as Jesus gives hope to the hopeless. And you know this story in John chapter 8, it's a, a woman caught in the act of adultery. And even though it takes two to tango, they, they only brought the woman, they didn't bring the man. And the Bible says that they stood her up in front of everyone. So we, I used to think that they threw her to the ground, but no, they stood her up for everyone to see, just to add to her disgrace. She probably is trying to cover herself. And these religious leaders say, Jesus, the law of Moses says that you should stone such a person. Uh, what, what do you say? And Jesus doesn't say anything for a while. And then in verse seven, this is what he says. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And the Bible says that when Jesus said that, that, uh, that the older people left first and then gradually the next group and then the younger people. Max Locato describes it by saying, they left from the grayest beard to the blackest beard, dropping their rocks of righteousness intended to stone the lust out of her life. Jesus says, where are your accusers? Is there anyone here? Look at verse 11. No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Don't miss this. Neither do I condemn you. Grace, leave your life of sin. Truth. Grace and truth right there in the same sentence. That's the way Jesus was. Jesus saw the whole situation. Jesus sees the deeper story. And the thing I love about Jesus, he, he sees her in her darkest sin and in her toughest hour, and he gives her hope. A few chapters later, turn over to John chapter 11. Jesus grieves with the hurting. And you might remember this. In John chapter 11, verse 35 is the shortest verse in all the Bible. If you ever asked to quote a verse, you always got one in the hopper, all right? <laughs> Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. Boom, take that. So if somebody puts you on the spot, you're ready now, right? But remember the setting. The setting goes back to our previous story because you have Mary, who is the sister of, of, of Lazarus. You have Martha, who is a sister of Lazarus, and something is happening here. What's happening is their brother is, is died. Jesus comes on the scene four days later, and when he, when he finally arrives, they're crying because he's been dead for four days. And you remember what, what happens here, right? Jesus starts to cry with them. That's John eleven thirty five. 35. Now, Jesus didn't have to do that. But he did because he was divine and he was also human. He was vulnerable. He knew what it was like to, to lose a loved one. It would have been real easy for Jesus to say when he saw them crying, say, hey, you know what? Just hang in there just a few minutes and wink at the girls, right? He doesn't do that. Instead, he allows himself to get into the situation. Rather than stuffing away the sadness, he recognizes the pain. Jesus grieved deeply because he loved deeply. And later at the tomb, he calls out the name Lazarus, come out. And we've talked about this before. You know why he says Lazarus. Because if he doesn't say Lazarus, everyone in the cemetery will walk out when the Lord of life gives a command. And so he says, Lazarus, come out. I love the fact that he's specific there. You see, throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus is always showing value and giving honor to people by calling out their names. Simon. Mary, Zacchaeus, Thomas, Peter, and here, Lazarus. You see, he got close to people. While he is a powerful God, he is a personal God as well. You say, well, Dave, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at names. If that's what this series is about, I'm gonna have to learn people's names. Well, let me tell you something. I am terrible and pitiful at playing the guitar. You know why? I've never tried. I've never taken a lesson. I've never tried to learn. And what you'll find is when you become intentional about people mattering to you, something happens. You make that effort. 
You reach out, you try to learn that name, something that small, a stranger becomes a friend, an acquaintance deepens because of the small investment that reflects that you actually care about them. You've become involved in their life. And the thing I love about names is that behind every name there is a story. That's why I love baptisms here. There's a story behind every single name. Well, Jesus goes on to show that people matter as he humbles himself to receive from others. Now, this is, this is pretty cool. In John 12, he allows Mary to anoint his feet. Remember, Jesus has just brought Lazarus back from the dead, right? And so this is what she does as her lavish display to express her love to him. She takes this pint of pure nard, which was an expensive perfume and ointment. It was probably a family inheritance. The Bible tells us it was worth a year's salary. And she breaks it and she pours it all over Jesus' feet. Now, it, you could make a case for the fact that Jesus could have said, hey, 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 don't, don't do that, don't do that. Don't make such a big extravagant display here. You don't have to uh, you know, waste all of that. He, he could have said that, but he doesn't. He allows her to do it. And in so doing, he sets an example for us of how it is that we can learn to accept things from other people. I remember a few years ago, I, was at, I, I called in a carry-out order at, at Applebee's. I don't do a lot of carry-out, but I called one in. I pulled up outside there. A gal came walking out and brought me my food, and she said, hey, she said, I, I go to your church, and I, I in, enjoy hearing you preach. And I said, oh, great to meet you, and talked to her for a few minutes. I said, what do I owe you? She said, you don't owe anything. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, somebody already paid for yours. I said, now wait a second, how could somebody pay for mine when I called in and I came to pick it up? I said, wait a second, I said, did you get it for me? And she didn't say anything. And I said, oh, please, you, you don't need to do that. She said, no, I wanna do that. Now you know how hard it is to let an 18 or 19 year old kid that doesn't have much money do that for you? But Jesus showed us that we do that sometimes, why? Because that person's gonna get a blessing. It's fulfilling to them, they've, they've done something for you. So I know when you're sick and somebody comes over to help you out or I know when somebody runs an errand for you, you're like, oh, I don't want all this to do about me, but you know what? It's okay, it's the body of Christ being the body of Christ. And we all come together and we encourage and we help and we serve and we give and we do anything we possibly can. Let's look at one more example. Not only does he humble himself to receive from others, he also humbles himself to serve others. And you know the story in John 13. We'll, we'll finish our, our walk through John with this one. Uh, the basin boy didn't show up that night. It's the night of the Passover. And the kid that's supposed to be there, the minimum wage worker that's supposed to clean the dirty feet of people, uh, he, he doesn't show for some reason. And the disciples are just standing around. They're not gonna lounge where they eat. They're on the ground with their feet in somebody else's face until their feet are clean. So nobody's about to do it. They just keep waiting. So they're making small talk. And all of a sudden, they hear the sloshing of water. And somebody's like, oh, thank God he's here. Yeah, thank God he's here. In their, their peripheral vision, they see Jesus Christ, their master, with a towel and a basin, washing their feet. And Jesus does this to set an example. And I want you to understand the order of how things transpired that night. There are a lot of different things that happened that evening, but don't miss this. Judas is still there. And Judas is in that moment, and Jesus gets down, and he washes the feet of Judas. Can you imagine what that must have been like for Judas? Judas as Jesus is trying everything he possibly can to break through this hardened heart and for it to be receptive so that he can change. Jesus knows that Judas matters in his world and in his mind. Jesus saw people for who they could become rather than for who they were. In John chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So make an effort. Make an effort to serve, to comfort, to encourage, to grieve, to do all these different things that, that Jesus did. Here's a third challenge. In fact, every single week we're going to give you a challenge in this series. 
And this week, is a, it's an easy one. Uh, you can put it into, into practice. Inside your bulletin, you received a, a little card. It says, it mattered when. You actually have two of them. And it looks like this, and you just continue to complete that. And you write that, and you can put that in an envelope. If you want to add more paper to it, you can. Uh, but you send that to someone who has affirmed you or honored you and let you know that, that you mattered to them one time. You see, there are some things that people have done for you that they have no idea how significant it was what they did. And you can say to them, uh, it mattered when you did this for me. Maybe they do know, but use it as an opportunity to encourage, uh, to, to help someone to know that you appreciate that they were intentional, that they, that they validated you. And long after the encounter is over, the postcard has been received, or the service project is done, just realize this, there should be a taste in, in someone's mouth about Jesus Christ. It should be a taste of Christianity. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. I love this. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. That last phrase means that, that you are trying to be a fragrance, the sweet smell of Christ to those who are Christ followers and those who are not. We do this for everyone. We don't have rules on who it is that we can serve. God is going to intersect your life with different people over the course of the next six weeks. And we want the aroma of Christ to be what is left with them for them to realize that it's Jesus that causes you to do something like that. Jesus was constantly reaching out to others, regardless of how great they were or how unknown they were, whether they were rich or poor, young or old, sinner or saint. No person is beyond the love of Jesus Christ. He had conversations with an ambitious lawyer, an adulterous woman, a doubting disciple, a money-hungry tax collector, a wealthy ruler, a poor single mom, a criminal on a cross, an unclean woman in a crowd, a paralyzed man, a foreign woman who just needed a drink of water who had been married five times. And to every single person Jesus came in contact with, they always knew that they mattered to him. You see, Jesus Christ loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. He just loves you too much. So what if you were to become more intentional about interacting with others? What if you looked for ways to treat others like Jesus would or like Jesus did? You know, people do matter and, and churches are built on, on Jesus as the foundation and, and, and our beliefs are dictated by God's word. But the leaders can play a pivotal role in the direction that the church takes. And I'm so thankful that, that Kyle Eidelman is, is the man who is your senior pastor. There's no question that he's ready. He's, he's been ready. He was raised with a, a heart for ministry. His godly parents did a great job of, of, of raising Kyle and, and his two sisters. And uh, they all love the Lord. He has been instrumental in our continued growth and in our expansion. His Bible studies and books have, have impacted literally millions of people his commitment to Christ, his, his love for his family, his, his generosity, his humility, and the way he's handled success at a young age are things that are rare to find in the evangelical world. And being in the second seat uh, isn't always easy to do, especially when, when he's done it for 17 years. But he has done it with loyalty and with honor and with class, and he has encouraged me and he has waited patiently. Our staff sees Kyle as an exceptional leader, and I'm anxious for you all to get to see, see him in that role because I don't think you get to see him in that role. In that second seat, he's not going to uh, utilize his leadership gifts uh, un until he, he really feels that freedom to. Um, you need to know something. I, I would not have stayed as a senior pastor of this church for even my second year if it hadn't been for Kyle Eidelman. And uh, I will 
be on staff supporting Kyle any and every way that I can for the next couple of months. I will be preaching four more times in the next 10 weeks. My last weekend at Southeast will be on Memorial Day weekend, May 25th and 26th. Uh, you pray for Kyle during this stretch. There's some weeks that he won't be preaching in the next few weeks. These are really pivotal times as he is working on some big direction uh, issues and areas that can help us continue to fulfill our mission. So let me be very uh, clear for you. You look to Christ first and you look to him. And after that, you, you look to Kyle as your spiritual leader. And today he becomes your new senior pastor. I have no problem looking to Kyle in this role because I know that he will point all of us back to Jesus Christ and back to God's word. If you have a complaint, if you have a complaint to make, then you tell it to God or you share it with me. If you have a compliment to give, then you give it to Kyle. Kyle. It is important for us to be united uh, as we move forward, and I have sensed in the last six months just an incredible sense of unity, which says a lot about you, but it also says a whole lot about Kyle. So pray for Kyle, pray for Desiree, and uh, right now I'm gonna invite you to welcome your new senior pastor to come out here, uh, Kyle Eidelman. <laughs> I know you're hungry and you're ready to go, so have, have a seat. Man, I, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I am, uh, you know, beyond words, humbled and thankful, so thankful to God and his grace um, to be a part of what God has done here in the past 17 years and to be a part of what God's going to do. Uh, I, I'm just really excited about it. When I was 16 years old, I went with my high school youth group to a student conference. I don't remember really anything about the conference except for that Dave was preaching. And I was a sophomore in high school, got to meet him after he finished preaching, and I remember it. It was a significant moment for me, and I didn't even know why at the time, but God knew. And I'm so thankful that he has allowed our paths to come together the last number of years. Dave has been uh, the ultimate example for me in ministry these last number of years of humility, of integrity, of loving other people. And I, I am incredibly grateful for uh, being able to follow someone who has that kind of reputation and foundation and has, has showed me how to do it. Um, I want you to know that from the beginning, since he's been senior pastor, he has gone out of his way to include me in ways that I don't know of any other senior pastor who's done it. I, he he um, invited me to be an elder right away. He's shared the preaching with me even the last four or five years, going out of his way to make sure that I was preaching as much as he did and just, uh, just making me feel like a full partner. It is incredibly appropriate, I think, that you would choose to do it on this weekend, uh, as you start this series called People Matter, because church, I'm telling you that the va that value of loving people that he has for 30 years of ministry at this church, he has lived that out uh, every day and in ways that you don't even know. He wanted me to just come out and just, he just wanted to pray for me, but I'm like, uh, you're not in charge anymore, so I, I, I get to talk for a few minutes. Um, you know, what's important for both of us is that you know and that these next number of months not be about us. Uh, Dave doesn't want it to be about him. I don't want it to be about me. Uh, this is all about Jesus, and, and we both know that God could use anybody he wants to to do this. He could use anyone he wants to. It's not because we've earned it or we deserve it or we've worked hard enough. It's not because we're gifted enough or talented enough or creative enough. 
It is all God's grace. And so we want that to be our focus. Um, in the upcoming months, he's gonna preach, as he mentioned, a number more times, and, and we'll have some opportunities uh, as a church family to express our appreciation and gratitude for, uh, for his faithful service. Um, more than anything, we would just ask you for your, your prayers. Uh, we are completely dependent upon God's power, and uh, we wanna just pray every day. Would you pray for our families? Would you pray for his continued blessing upon this church? Yeah, so let me, uh, let me pray for this man right now, and you guys just join with me in this. And Lord, rather than just uh, imagining a church who lives and loves like everyone mattered, will you help us become that church? One step at a time, one person at a time. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the man beside me. I thank you for the way he stood beside me through thick and thin for all these years, 17 years, and I uh, thank you for the fact that you have gifted him and you have prepared him for this role. There no one is better prepared for this role. And uh, you have gifted him in unique ways, Lord. He has a talent to preach, he has a talent to, to lead and to teach. <laughs> he has a talent to write, uh, he loves people. Lord, I pray that you will just give him creativity Give him ideas of things to build your kingdom that, that we have not even thought of, that we're scratching our heads later saying, why, why didn't we think of that? And, and Lord, just use him to that end. May your spirit be upon him. Lord, I pray for Kyle and Desiree. Pray you'll be so close to, to, to her that she will sense and know that, that you are right there for her in the tough times of ministry. I pray for every one of their four kids. She'll be right there with them. Thank you that they all love you and that they're all living for you. Lord, I pray for, for Kyle as he goes through this, this time of, of, of transition and takes this helm. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you will use him in a powerful way. May he do twice as much as anything that's ever been done before. May your spirit be on him in a fresh and powerful way. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you will give him discernment and wisdom for the tough decisions that he has to make. Uh, I pray more than anything else that he will be at peace and know that, that you are God and you're on throne and you, you are still the one who runs his church. And so we pray for our brother and our friend and we can't wait to see how you're gonna use him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, buddy.